Hey everybody, welcome to our fourth week of our um, buildings short course. Uh, this week we're going to be talk ab talking about uh, alternative buildings approach, altern alternative, uh, sorry, uh, building approaches. And this is Erin here. I spoke with you a little bit in class two when we talked about um, some commercial building uh, retrofits. Um, so I like to start with an intro activity while we're getting ready for people to uh, join us here. So I want you all to take a minute and think about this question. So what are some of the features, building techniques uh, that you see today in buildings that don't make sense from an energy and a water efficiency standpoint? So my particular example here with my little photo um, is the fact that we tend to have, still have in many areas, uh, grass lawns and plants that require uh, heavy water use and irrigation in arid regions where we don't have enough rainfall to sort of keep those watered on their own without the use of a sprinkler system. Um, so go ahead, take a minute, think through that, um, write down some ideas, and we're going to come back to this at the end of class and discuss it a little bit more in depth. And we'll give you a couple minutes to do that while we wait for everyone to, to join us. I'm getting a question of where are we supposed to write this down? So you can either write it down sort of on your own and have it to hang on to later, or if you want, I made a sheet for us in the Google Drive for when we talk about the um, when we talk about this a little later. So just do the, I guess, sort of the first two columns for now. What is this building norm and why it is that we do it? And then uh, at the end of the class, we're going to talk about the alternatives and how we get to those alternatives. And while we're doing that, um, we have a question from Lainey about missing last week's webinar and to get caught up um, where she can find the audio. Andrew, can you answer that for her? Uh, and to answer the other question on here from Anna about if she missed a webinar and typed up the notes to make up for it, where does she need to send them um, to get attendance? Those can be sent to Andrew Beck. I'm typing his email address in the chat box here. And you can just send those to him. Uh, and someone typed that in there already. Um, so in answer to the question about where you can find the webinar, um, so there's usually a recap email uh, that gets sent out and it'll be included with this week's uh, recording recap as well. So you can get both this today's webinar and last week's webinar through that email. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started with our notes today. All right, so in today's class, we're going to be essentially learning from archaeology, history, anthropology. It's going to be a little bit different. Of course, we're going to have an engineering spin on it. 
Uh, but we're going to take a look at some building designs that have been used historically um, in other countries and other cultures or in parts of the United States a long time ago. Um, and I, I, I like to say that it's important, even I feel like as engineers sometimes we think our, you know, our core engineering classes and our science classes are really the only classes uh, that matter for us in our career and even in, in school to get our degree. And that some of these other classes are just like side classes that you take as an EVA. Uh, but it's actually important to pay attention to these courses as well because you can learn a lot. Um, from the way things work in these societies and what we're going to be looking at today is some of those different building features. And these are all things you wouldn't necessarily hear about um, in a traditional engineering class, even an engineering class uh, focused on building design. And so that picture I have here is just a tra traditional mud hut in Tanzania. So when we talk about rammed earth buildings, a building type that's becoming popular today, um, you know, this will just give you an idea of where some of those early uh, rammed earth building designs come from uh, and where they've been used besides in the United States. All right, so I wanted to put these two side-by-side -side pictures here to get you started in general in uh, looking at the differences in how we think about modern engineering design today uh, versus how engineering has sort of looked at historically, been looked at historically. So on the left have uh, the Great Inca Road, it's called. This was a road built around 500 years ago. It's still in use today. This is a, you know, a recent picture showing that the road has held up over time. Uh, it's a 20,000, yes, that's 20,000 mile long road that connected the Inca center uh, city of Cusco uh, to all ends of the Inca empire, which extended to what today are Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile. Um, so it was a huge road, it was a huge uh, undertaking, a huge infrastructure project. And you can see here it looks very different than the road we have on the right, which is a modern road in Canada. And one of the main differences is that with this type of road, with this ancient type of engineering, they worked with the natural features that they had in their landscape instead of around them. So for example, I mean, this is not a, a road that's passable by car, you can tell it has um, steps instead, it was, passable, it was made for animals and uh, for people on foot. Um, but they worked with the natural landscape. So instead of blasting through the mountainside, uh, they sloped it along you know, the side of the hill and the hill. And this went through mountains. It went through jungle. It went through all types of different terrains. Um, and it was designed in a way that it's held up over 500 years and it's still in good shape. Today, when we want to make a road, we tend to you know, blast through whatever rock formation uh, that we have to get to. Uh, to get through and sort of we make the, the landscape adapt to the road instead of the opposite way around. And so a lot of the modern uh, building techniques we're going to talk about today sort of do the same thing. We use the natural land, they use the natural landscape, they design for the landscape they're in instead of having certain engineering design standards and ways of doing things and making the, the you know, natural surroundings sort of conform to those. Uh, so we have today what we consider to be a human-dominated ecosystem. Uh, really, humans have dominated all sorts of plant species, whether it be cultivating crops for agriculture, uh, clear-cutting forests to make room for our agriculture or our housing development. Uh, what you can see here is an overhead view of a suburb in Las Vegas. So you can very clearly see the difference between where this suburb area ends uh, and where sort of the natural desert region begins. You can even see the areas where they're starting to build developments but haven't yet developed out. Um, it's a totally different landscape in these areas that have been developed versus sort of the natural landscape. Um, you can imagine there's been a lot of leveling done to flatten out. You can see a lot of green within these suburbs. Again, these are those green lawns I was talking about in my example uh, as a way that we sort of um, alter the landscape around us to suit our needs and our, our building norms. And part of that is having, you know, that typical American house with the, the, the green lawn out in front. Whether or not you're situated in a climate that's really suitable for that green lawn and that type of landscaping or not. And so not only do we uh, engineer the environment around us and tend to ignore the, the natural landscape, but since we have a, a globalized world, we're not limited to only using local materials. Essentially, you can get any material from anywhere around the globe shipped to you um, for your building. Uh, you're not uh, limited to using only what's local, as people were in ancient societies. So this really changes the way we as well. Um, 
And so as engineers, we tend to think we want to help teach people to be more like industrialized countries. And of course, in many ways we do. We want people to have access to electricity and sanitation and running water. Um, but in reality, there's also a lot we can learn from traditional societies in the way they build their buildings, um, the way they use uh, sustainable agricultural practices, and in some other areas as well. And that's what we're going to be looking at here. And so my disclaimer here, I am not an archaeologist uh, nor a building expert. Um, I am an engineer who happens to have spent a lot of time working in um, indigenous communities in Guatemala and Mexico and Peru, and I'm really just interested in the way um, they do things there, including uh, the way they build. All right, so today we're going to focus on three different types of building features. Uh, the first are early cooling systems, so we're going to look at a couple different techniques for cooling in the pre-air conditioning era. Uh, these are systems known as passive cooling. We're going to look at some early roofing systems that were used to help keep temperature um, or help control the climate within homes as well as keep uh, rainwater out of the house. And we're going to look at a couple different early wall construction techniques, two specifically that are being brought back today and are now gaining popularity in the U.S. as sort of an alternative uh, building technique for homes. And of course, if at any point you have questions um, during the presentation, feel free to do the, the raise your hand feature or type in uh, a question into the, the question box here, and I'll do my best to answer it. All right, so starting with passive cooling systems, I don't know where you are, all are located, but I am in upstate New York where we're having a major heat wave. It's been in the mid-90s here uh, for the past three days. So air conditioning, of course, has been on my mind. Um, I actually don't have air conditioning in my house, but that's quite uncommon, even in areas like upstate New York, uh, like the Northeast, where we have a pretty cool climate and not necessarily that many days that you need air conditioning. Uh, newer buildings are often built with central air, so it's the norm for us to have an air conditioning system in our house. Uh, air conditioning, as we talked about earlier, is one of the more energy intensive features uh, in a house, keeping a building cool when it's hot out. Um, if designed to stay cool through passive cooling techniques, uh, can be a, a pretty big uh, use of energy and, of course, an expense. Um, so since the times of the Romans, people have been attempting to keep their homes cool um, in sort of an early passive cooling system. Uh, the Romans, we all know that the Romans had aqueducts that they used to pipe water into their cities um, out of the mountains. Um, but also in the homes of the rich, they would run channels of this water through the walls of people's homes, and the water, of course, was cool because it was coming down from higher elevations uh, as, a, as an early way of cooling the houses by, you know, cooling that thermal wall, thermal mass of those stone walls uh, and keeping the temperature inside those houses lower than they would be otherwise. So another example are something called wind catchers. And these were used in the Middle East uh, to funnel air down into buildings and at the same time to vent out warm air. So since warm air rises, uh, it rises up and passes out of these, these uh, openings in the building. At the same time, cool air is being blown into the building and forced down towards the ground uh, by the natural shape of these wind catchers. And so these are um, features that you see in uh, Persian-influenced, Persian-inspired agriculture, um, including uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, you can still see some of these older buildings still standing today that have these features. So they were designed to let wind in, but at the same time keep sand out. So they were oriented specifically to the location and to the, um, the way the winds typically blow in that specific area because you don't just want a huge opening on top of your house where you can get sand blowing in during sandstorms, uh, but you want to be able to let air in and keep buildings cool. And these are areas where they have a much hotter climate than we have here um, for me in upstate New York, uh, where we think we can't possibly live without air conditioning. And they managed to get by uh, by using passive cooling systems like these uh, to keep the interior of their buildings at a low enough temperature uh, to make it you know, comfortable. Um, so even though this is an old technology, uh, this is used uh, in some modern architecture. It's not used very frequently, so this is one particular example um, where they attempted to bring back that type of design feature. Uh, this is in Zion National Park in Utah. Uh, they used a wind catcher. You can kind of see that on top of this tower here. It's a little bit difficult to see what's going on there, but they essentially have openings um, 
screen openings where the air can come into the building to create a mechanical free cooling so you don't need an air conditioner or an air handler to keep this building cool. And so the building schematic for that kind of shows what's going on in here. The hot air is passing in and natural, um, there's a natural downdraft going on. Uh, the cool air is going through this tower and entering into the building. Um, as air heats up, it comes back out of this tower where it first entered. And they have some other features you can see going on here as well. They have some PV panels. Uh, they have windows with overhangs that are, uh, are shaded. The windows are designed in a way that they provide daylighting, and they use a trom wall for heating, which we're not going to talk about today, but it's a, a, a method of passive heating that heats up an exterior airspace and lets the air pass into the build, warm air pass into the building. So another example of early air conditioning comes from India in the 16th century, where they would use indoor pools, uh, sometimes many stories underground. Uh, for air conditioning. So the water evaporating from these pools helps to cool the building, in, building interior, uh, cool down the air within this space, and again, keep those buildings at a nice cool temperature, even in a very hot climate. So another feature uh, used in the same region, and this is one of the features that was discussed in the assigned um, reading article in that same building that used those underground pools uh, was the idea of sort of a, a double wall with an exterior screen. So you can kind of see the two layers here. We're kind of looking into the airspace between the two layers. So we have this outer screened wall to allow some daylight to pass through. Um, but at the same time, we have this inner airspace area that's insulating uh, the building from extreme temperatures, keeping it from getting too hot uh, by providing this airspace in between but still letting some, some light through, through this screened uh, portion of the building and through some uh, glass windows here. So it's kind of like an extra building envelope um, that's allowing it to maintain a, a cooler temperature. So the picture here is a picture of a traditional Mayan home. So this is a construction that a technique that is still used today in many Mayan regions in both the Yucatan Peninsula, Guatemala, Belize, um, anywhere where they have Mayan population living, populations living. And again, these were homes that were designed to allow air to flow through the walls uh, while still preventing water from entering the homes during floods. Um, so what you can see going on here is there's a lower sort of stone layer of the building. Uh, you can see that on the, the picture, the schematic on the right, and it goes a little bit higher in the picture shown on the left here. Um, but it, that's designed so when there's a hard rain or even like small amounts of flooding, the water's not going to come up into your home. Uh, but on top of that, you have a more open build. So these are just um, vertical sticks, essentially, um, vertical tree branches uh, lined up closely together. So there's little cracks in between, allowing air to flow through into the home. When the wind blows through, you get a nice breeze um, in your house. But you have that higher wall protecting you from rain, and the roof overhang is done in a way that it hangs off far enough so rainwater runs off the roof and sort of away from your house so you don't get rainwater blowing into your house um, when it's rainy. So in addition to building their homes in a way that allow air to flow through their homes, people actually sleep in hammocks as well. Again, this is still done today um, in many of those regions. Uh, as a way of keeping cool when they're sleeping. When you're sleeping on a mattress and it's 100 degrees out, um, you know, there's no airflow around your body underneath you, especially if you're sinking into the mattress. Um, whereas if you're sleeping in a hammock, essentially air is flowing on all sides of your body. It helps keep you cool. Um, so just another neat way that we change the way we, we sleep and think, of, think about our behaviors uh, when you're in a different area uh, that has a, a hot climate that's well suited for that sort of open air construction. And so these types of houses um, also have a, a thatched roof, a palm thatched roof. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um, but basically everything here is built from local building materials. The stones are sourced locally. Uh, the branches are from local trees. And the thatched palm um, also come from those same trees where the branches come from. So it's something that if a part portion breaks or needs to be replaced, it can easily be fixed by the homeowner. Uh, so the way people do construction in many of these uh, areas and in many indigenous societies and the way it was done traditional uh, tends to differ than the way we do it now as well. I mean, now if something goes on with your roof, 
very few people are actually getting out on their own roof repairing it themselves. You're calling a contractor and you're having someone order materials for you and come in and do the construction. Um, in these types of communities, construction tends to be uh, a more communal-based activity. So not only would people be working on their own home, but other families um, within the community, their neighbors, uh, would get together and help them out with this building, because it's a fairly, still a fairly big undertaking to construct a new home. Uh, knowing that in the future, when it came time for these families to build their home or do some sort of construction project, uh, they would receive that same sort of help in return. And we call that reciprocal labor. Um, and that's something you don't see as much currently. We live much more in a, a cash-based economy um, where you hire a contractor to do any work on your house instead of relying on the help of your friends uh, and neighbors to build something. And so that Inca Road I showed you in the beginning sort of falls under that same uh, principle. So now really, you know, our roads are, we all pay for our roads, but we pay in the form of taxes. Government collects taxes from us, and that tax money goes towards funding the road. Um, with the Inca, instead of doing a tax system where people would give money, everyone's dues, they owed the government um, a certain amount of time, of labor time, put into building that road. So instead of sending your money, you would send your, your manpower and you would go out and spend a certain amount of time um, working to construct those roads and working to maintain and upkeep those roads. So it's just a very different way of thinking about um, undertaking construction and infrastructure projects. Uh, that makes things a little bit different. So a lot of these construction techniques are um, a little more labor intensive, but a little less technical and less skilled and things that um, anyone in the community could easily be trained to do, whereas our construction techniques tend to be more uh, specialized. You need to be a contractor, have some experience uh, working in buildings. Before I jump into early roofing, do we have any questions about these early cooling air conditioning systems? Thoughts on the way we do air conditioning here in the U.S. or questions about it? All right, I don't see anything, so I'm going to keep going on to our next topic, so um, early roofing systems. So this is a picture taken in a Peruvian highland community. This is one of the communities where I actually worked and did my uh, graduate research. Um, so you can see here their house is made of adobe blocks, that's a traditional building uh, material there, so people make their own adobe bricks. Um, they mix the adobe, they put it into block formations, and they leave it out in the sun, and it hardens. And then after they've made enough of these bricks, they you know, get together in one of these community building events, and they all sort of build uh, the individual's house um, by stacking up these bricks. They have a chimney over here to vent uh, smoke out of the house for cooking. And they use these thatch roofs made of palm. Uh, so these roofs are actually, these are actually straw, not palm, uh, sorry. Um, they're very thick thick layer of straw. They're a great insulator. Um, they help keep the houses warm. Uh, this is at 12,000 meters or 12,000 feet in elevation, around 4,000 meters. So it's a climate that gets extremely cold uh, overnight. Um, so keeping houses uh, well insulated and warm is important. And straw roofs are great at doing that. At the same time, uh, they're also good for channeling the water off, just like you would see with any type of um, corrugated roof or any other material roof, the water runs right off them um, and provides a, a low cost, locally sourced uh, building material for making roofs. So one of the disadvantages, disadvantages of this is that you do have to replace them every five to ten years. The straw does get worn down, um, but that's not necessarily that much uh, shorter than the life of a, of a modern asphalt roof. Um, and so you can see here some people are starting to use corrugated roofs. There's a little piece of uh, corrugated roof here on the chimney, and there's a piece of corrugated roof uh, on this other building here off to the side. Um, so in part, this is happening because it's less labor intensive to get the corrugated roof, and in part it's happening because it's become sort of a status symbol to use modern building materials. Um, even though these roofs have no insulation uh, whatsoever, they're not as good as keeping the buildings warm. 
it's seen as sort of a, a sign of modernity if you're building a house um, using corrugated metal instead of using the traditional straw material. And there's actually been a lot of, um, not a lot of pressure, I want to say, but there's a lot of, um, a lot of negative negativity associated with um, indigenous uh, cultures in many places, um, you know, that these are backwards cultures, they need to modernize, they need to use modern building materials and stop growing their, you know, traditional crops and using, modernize their agriculture. Um, and that's done actually a lot of uh, damage in a lot of places um, that are better suited to using the sustainable agriculture techniques that they've been using for thousands of years and to using building materials uh, like straw that people can essentially get for free uh, and build on their own. But you can see here both of those different examples coming into place even within one family's house. So these are two different buildings uh, that belong to the same family and they use those two different uh, building styles there. So I think I mentioned when we did the, uh, the week on uh, retrofits for commercial buildings that one of the things we see more frequently now is um, green roofs. And we like to think that green roofs are this new, great technology that we've developed uh, in the US. In reality, in Scandinavia, these types of green roofs, sod-covered roofs, uh, were the most commonly used types of roofs on this style of log home up until the 19th century. So we like to think it's something new. Really, it was the norm uh, for a long time uh, in this region. And so you can see here, you essentially just have a thick layer of sod, grass growing out it. Uh, growing out of it on top of your roof. So it looks a little bit different than the green roofs that we're used to seeing today. Uh, the green roofs that you see in the U.S. tend to be flat roofs. They have different types of plants, uh, not grass, but it's sort of the same uh, general concept. And so these types of green roofs are important because, again, they provide insulation. They have a pretty thick uh, layer of dirt or sod underneath. Um, they help reduce storm water runoff because instead of all the water being channeled off the roof into the street or whatever it is, uh, a lot of that water is absorbed uh, by that grass. And that's the same thing we look for in green roofs in cities as well, and that's why uh, one of the reasons they're so popular, they can help reduce uh, storm water runoff, which is especially important in crowded city areas where you have a lot of buildings and potentially a lot of runoff. Uh, they create an additional wildlife habitat by providing a living space for, for insects and worms uh, on top of the roof. And in cities, they reduce the heat island effect. So instead of having uh, you know, a slab of concrete on top of the roof that's absorbing heat uh, and, and sort of heating up that entire block or area leading to what we call the heat island effect, um, you have this, this roofing or this grass material that's um, it doesn't absorb heat and hold heat in the same way that, that concrete does. And these are just a couple different pictures of areas where they have uh, those sod covered roofs still in place today. So I mentioned that even though uh, oftentimes these early building materials they use are cheaper, so building a house out of adobe costs almost nothing if you have local adobe. Using a straw roof or a palm roof is not expensive or doesn't cost anything if you grow straw or palm. Uh, but they tend to be more um, time intensive and more labor intensive. And I guess I already sort of talked about this um, with the way Quechua communities use, Quechua communities or communities uh, in the Andes region. Um, my communities in the Yucatan region do this as well, but with the way they use reciprocal labor to help each other out. Um, so they make up for the fact that these are some more labor, can be more labor intensive building techniques um, by relying on people within the community to help them out to sort of undertake these, these building projects. And like I said, that same strategy was also done for, for road maintenance. I'm skipping this since I sort of already said this as well. So because we can get materials from around the globe and based on our local climate, we design sort of on building norms. And you can see this if you go throughout the United States. We have extremely different uh, climates in the United States, but a suburb in eastern U.S. looks the same as a suburb in southwestern. It looks the same as a suburb in the Midwest. 
Um, so we really, for the most part, don't design our buildings based around the climate we're, we're located in. We design our buildings based on what we think of as standard of as what a, an American house should look like. All right, so there are two ancient building techniques um, for construction that have been making a recent comeback. You may have heard about one or, or both of these. Uh, the first is constructing homes out of rammed earth, also called adobe, uh, and the second is making straw bale homes. And we're going to look uh, a little bit more specifically through how these processes work. And so remember in that first picture I showed that hut in Tanzania and I said that's essentially a, a rammed earth building. Um, so what rammed earth means is ramming. Uh, a mixture of uh, gravel, sand, silt, and clay into a plywood framework that you make one layer at a time, packing down in between, adding an additional layer, packing it down at one, uh, and building up walls uh, by repeating this process until you get to the desired height. Um, so again, you have this, what you can see here, you're kind of looking at a cross-section of a plywood framework, and you can see the layers of earth that are added when they're wet uh, being being added one by one and compressed down. When you're done, you take away the plywood, uh, you're left with a, a nice smooth rammed earth wall that kind of has this cool stratified uh, look to it from the fact that it was different layers added. Um, and so rammed earth was an early construction technique used in Morocco. I'm not going to try and pronounce uh, the name of that village. I looked up the pronunciation and I already forgot it. Um, it was built in the 1600s, and it's still standing today. And you can kind of see the, the stratification uh, going on there if you look closely um, at some of the walls. So again, this is not a new technique, but it's something that is been being um, ad adopted uh, more recently because it's considered to be a more sustainable uh, building technique. So here are a couple examples of rammed earth construction in progress. Uh, so some of the reasons it's a good building material are some of the um, the strengths of this. Um, it's very strong in compression, so because of that it's suitable for multiple story houses and for load-bearing houses, so you're not uh, contained to only making small buildings with it. It has a really high thermal mass, which means it holds, uh, maintains its temperature very well, and so because of that it's best for climates with a 10 or more degrees Celsius difference between day and night temperatures. So you want something that's going to get, you know, the the walls are going to be heated up by the sun during the day and it's going to hold on to that thermal mass and sort of slowly release it over nighttime when it gets colder. <laughs> and because it has a high thermal mass, it does have a poor um, insulation value. So again, that's why you want it with that, those climates with that difference. You want to use the thermal mass to sort of level out the differences between those hot and the cold temperatures. You don't want somewhere where it's cold all the time because you'll essentially have to heat your house and just be losing heat uh, through, these, through these walls. So a few different uh, pictures you can see here. They still have, I believe this is the ply, no, this isn't the plywood. So this is the, the rammed earth after the plywood's been taken down. Um, so some more advantages. Um, they're great for noise insulation. It's a, obviously a pretty thick wall. Um, you can't hear much going on outside of the house. Um, it's very fireproof. It's clay, so it doesn't really burn like wood would in a traditional home. Um, it's durable. You know, you saw that picture of the city in Morocco that was built in the 1600s. It's still standing. Um, so it does require, to make it more durable, it does require a waterproofing um, or a special coating if you're building this type of um, building in an area uh, with a very rainy uh, or humid climate where the building's going to be exposed to a lot of moisture. But that's a fairly easy surface treatment that can be put on after construction. Uh, that will give those walls a uh, longer life. It's a breathable material, um, non-toxic, which is something that's important. You hear a lot about um, buildings having you know, formaldehyde and drywall or different building materials that off-gas into the house and end up causing a lot of um, people. So this is very natural. I mean, it's essentially you know, clay from the earth uh, that's being used, so you don't have to worry about chemicals being leached into your house. Um, while you're in there. Um, so the environmental impact of rammed earth, it's considered to be um, low manufacturing impact if it's sourced locally. So it's not like a product where the manufacturing is going on somewhere else and you're shipping it um, you know, to your construction site. This is best for areas that actually have this type of um, clay um, available locally. 
transported. Um, it creates very little building waste when you're actually doing the construction, so those plywood frameworks um, that you're building can be reused, can be reused to build multiple houses and can be used uh, to make more than one wall, again, because they're just temporary. You're only using that uh, portion to build one wall and then you're moving it out of the way to build another one. Um, so the, the manufacturer of the, the materials used to go into it um, doesn't create a high level of greenhouse gas emissions. So this can be, this is, this is true unless um, you're building a rammed earth house in an area where these materials aren't naturally occurring because essentially you're just going to add, um, you're going to have, you're going to have to use fuel to ship to you which kind of takes away um, from the fact that it was, you know, it's designed to be a low environmental impact building. So it doesn't necessarily make sense. Uh, it's not a very sustainable building technique if you're in an area with a uh, material for building. Um, or if cement is mixed in, so sometimes, let's see if we had that in the, in that first slide. So sometimes cement is mixed in with this gravel uh, and sand clay mixture, um, but cement as you probably know, is not a very environmentally uh, friendly building material. Um, and so if you're adding a lot of cement into the mixture, or the, at least the processing of cement, very environmentally friendly process. Um, so if you're adding a lot of cement to your mixture because, you again, you don't have um, the type of clay soil that's well suited to it, you're potentially um, taking away from the, the positive uh, environment of the building. Um, and another positive, it tends to reduce building energy use due to temperature stabilization. So again, during the day, if you're in a warm climate, it'll heat up that, um, that rammed earth and that heat will be stored and slowly released overnight. So you don't need heating when the temperature drops during the day and you don't need cooling uh, during the daytime. So just a few other pictures of what rammed earth construction looks like. Um, you can see here that you can have a nice, comfortable, modern looking home using this building material. It doesn't look like you're living in a, uh, a mud hut. Uh, well, it's rammed earth because you can see those, those built up layers and it kind of has a nice, uh, a nice look to it. They're really using this in the, the features of the house. They're using it to the design. It could be painted over, but they're choosing not to just sort of show those that naturally. Uh, natural characteristic, but these are both pretty modern looking, comfortable looking houses that, you know, we could all probably see ourselves living in. So it's important to see that, you know, even though these are techniques that were used traditionally in often very remote and rural areas, um, they're not suited, you know, they're not unsuited for, for modern living. And so the second one we're going to talk about is straw bale constructions. Uh, so building houses out of straw has been done on the African plains since the Paleolithic area, era. Sorry, um, In the United States, Native Americans used straw insulation uh, in their teepees. Uh, and today we're seeing a growth in this sort of straw bale construction design. Um, you can see a little cross section of what that looks like here. It's bales of straw stacked up on top of each other in a brick pattern. Essentially, you're making bricks out of straw and stacking them up and using them as your building material, sort of pinned into place with this rebar or whatever this is, uh, holding them there in this case. Um, and then uh, with a plaster outer, a lime plaster outer layer to sort of insulate uh, the straw and make it waterproof. Um, so one other thing that I'll point out here in this design uh, is that they show that they have sensors placed in the wall to monitor moisture. So that's one of the keys for straw build, building is you don't want the inside of your wall to have any exposure to moisture or get wet because if that happens, essentially it'll start uh, rotting from the inside out, which is why they put these sensors in there so they can really early on address the problem if any moisture does get in there before it's sort of too late. So some pictures of straw bale construction uh, in process. In the, the top right picture here, they have all the bales stacked up, uh, but they don't yet have the plastering in place. In the lower picture here, you can see that they put sort of a wire mesh uh, layer on the outside and are then plastering to that to make that exterior finish. And so these are set on either a concrete or a timber foundation. They have a, um, a timber frame sort of outlining the building. Um, and then after the bales are stacked up like bricks or coated with that plaster, 
So straw bale is great because it has a really high insulation value, a really high R value, depending on how thick your bale is. Uh, your R value can be between 17 and 55. Uh, when you're making a house, I want to say it's more typical to use like R15 in the walls, maybe up to R22. Um, again, maybe Rob can help me with this at the end, but uh, or maybe some of you remember uh, from previous weeks. Uh, but R55 is almost unheard of unless you're really super insulating uh, your house. You wouldn't tend to use that much insulation. Um, so straw, unlike uh, rammed earth, has a low thermal mass, so it's the opposite. High insulator, a low thermal mass, so it doesn't hold on to, it doesn't hold heat. Um, it's very low cost uh, to build. Again, it's more labor intensive um, because we're not using machinery, you're using manual labor uh, to construct your building, um, but low cost. And it's actually fire resistant, so this uh, might be surprising. If some people might think a house of straw seems like it's you know, likely to go up in flames. Um, at any moment, but the straw is packed so densely that there's actually no air spaces in there. Um, and so when it's densely packed like that, it's actually not flammable because there's no oxygen. Um, so a fire can't burn um, in, a, in a situation with no oxygen. All right, so Rob says that most areas in the US R11 uh, is standard. Um, R, uh, it can go up to R, R30. But again, 11 is, is lower than you see with um, with these straw bales, so it's a it's a better insulator than the typical fiberglass that we would use uh, in homes in the U.S. And so this is this is actually a picture of people in a, a workshop learning to build uh, straw houses in San Diego. So if this is something that you're interested, there are lots of different organizations that are trying to teach this building technique. And like I said, it's fairly, uh, it's a construction technique that's fairly easy to learn. It's labor intensive, but it's not real skill labor. You have to have a general idea of what you're doing, um, but it's a fairly, you know, quick to learn, uh, quick to, easy to learn process. Um, so some other advantages, it can be made, the straw can be made from waste grain stalks. So a lot of grain stock, when the actual grain itself is taken off and used as animal feed, the stalks end up um, being just thrown away and not used. Uh, so you could build it as a waste material. There's nothing cheaper than that. Um, and it has a low embodied energy when you compare it to other insulating materials uh, like fiberglass. So some of the challenges with straw bale construction, one is that it can be hard to meet building codes. Or, you know, this is not our typical building material, so of course it's different. Um, it, it has different building requirements um, than other building materials do. And so when you have standards designed to a certain uh, style of house, uh, it can be harder to get a building that actually meets the codes when you're using such a strange novel building material like straw. Um, and I would imagine that over time uh, this will become easier if this becomes a more popular construction material. We'll maybe make you know uh, our own set of standards specific to straw building construction. Just like with rammed earth, if you're not using local materials, if you're shipping your straw from you know across the country, it's not actually uh, a sustainable building technique if you're using fossil fuels to get your materials there. Um, and you need to keep it dry. So I mentioned that with the moisture, the moisture sensors being built into the walls so as a way of monitoring. Um, and because you need to keep it dry, it's not a great building material for really highly humid, damp areas where it never really dries out just because you run the increased risk of um, having your walls get wet and sort of uh, rot. And just a couple other pictures of straw bale houses. So the other ones, these pictures again look a little bit more like modern homes that you can see yourself living in. These are a little bit more, um, I don't know, have more of a unique uh, look to them. But again, still look you know, like modern buildings that you would see in the US and might not realize by looking at them that they weren't built um, in a traditional way or in the more standard way. All right, so I want to go back to our um, activity of rethinking our building norms. Um, and I want to, um, I can unmute all of you or you can raise your hand and ask to be unmuted. And I want you to take a minute, fill these out, and then I want us to go through and talk about them. So let me see if I can actually get to the activity here. And if anyone's having trouble accessing that, let me know. I sent the link in the beginning. I'll send it uh, again right now.
Okay, so there's that link again. If you just wrote down your um, your starting ideas on a piece of paper, go ahead and put those in the uh, in the spreadsheet there. And so, so now what I want you to be doing is also be thinking about some alternatives um, and how we can get to those alternatives. So in the beginning, I talked about my example of grass lawns. Um, you know, I hate when you see areas that are practically deserts and areas where you have water scarcity. I mean, California is a great example right now. Um, but people still have this green grass because we have this ideal of the American dream where you should have this like perfectly kept green lawn and flowers growing in your lawn and you should be out there watering your lawn and putting fertilizer on it even though it's not very sustainable. So some alternatives to this would be of course planting um, local plants, plants that uh, don't need a lot of water, using the natural terrain instead of sort of clear cutting an area when it's developed. Typically when they put in a new housing development, they go through and clear cut everything in the entire area. They cut down trees and everything and then they plant landscaping in place. But by doing things like clear cutting any older trees, you're not providing any shade. Um, but again, it makes it easier. It gets it easier to makes it easier to get machinery in there, um, and allows us to build to sort of those standards that we're used to when we're starting with a clear uh, level landscape. And so sometimes the actually the how we get to the alternatives is even trickier than the what alternatives are there. Um, so in part for this one, I would say it's increasing awareness about water consumption. Um, providing information about other plants, so this could be free workshops for people that live in dry areas about what they can plant in their yard. Um, even getting people to change the way they, they think about landscaping in their yards and sort of changing the, that ideal of the, the green grass lawn, which you know might be the hardest, most difficult challenge of any of those. So I like the, I like the dog door one on here. Does whoever put that want to talk about that a little bit? Unmute. I'm just gonna un. Uh, I'm gonna unmute all, and then you can remute yourselves. So give me a minute to figure out how to do that. Not the bottom here. <laughs> you're, you're all unmuted, so make sure you remute yourself if you have a lot of background noise. Okay. All right. Who's the who's my dog door person, or who was the person that had their hand up? I lost it. Okay, so that was me. That was the dog goes. Um, this is Lainey, by the way. <laughs> um, hi, Lainey. Hi. <laughs> so, yeah, I, know, I was just thinking, I don't personally have one, but I know some of my friends do. Um, I don't know, it doesn't really make sense for you, but it just seems like a huge, like, waste because, I don't know, I don't, not, not exactly sure how it works, but, or, like, what the actual numbers are, but I'm sure it would like I said, just make a hole in like the installation basically because it's just like plastic with a little bit of um, like a seal around it. But clearly dogs can get or cats or whatever can get in and out pretty easily. So that's like a huge airflow, um, you know, depending on the season could raise the temperature of your house or lower it. But yeah. it's, uh, in terms of alternatives, some people, oh, okay. <laughs> people add some other stuff, but I was just thinking like, change your simply just let your dog out um, and like you have a solid door but, but I'm not I wasn't quite sure the put for how to get to those alternatives because those are the ones that I was thinking of like just having a solid door um, that's pretty standard um, but yeah. I don't know. Well, it could even be things like more awareness, like you mentioned that you know it has a lower insulation value, but people that aren't familiar with engineering might not necessarily recognize true, that or yeah. not have an idea of how much air is actually getting out of their house by having a pump door. Mm. And so maybe some of those technologies that Karen talked about in an earlier class when she talked about energy auditing, where you can bring in the camera and actually see all the heat escaping out of your house, could be mm. something that you could bring into people's homes and show them that. That's okay, different. yeah. Cool. What else do we have? I see untreated addicts. Anyone want to speak to that one? How about pools? <laughs> I like the alternative go in the ocean. <laughs> pools are a huge water use. Filling your pool is uh, is 
is pretty intense. I don't know the gallon values, but filling it at the beginning of the year and then maintaining uh, that level as some evaporates away. And if you're heating your pool, that can be a huge cost <coughs> um, to run a pool heater, um, typically using some either electricity or some uh, fuel. A lot of these just seem to be like changing to making their behavior. Yeah, and behavioral changes can be sometimes the toughest uh, ones to make actually because we're so used to, you know, we consider a pool to be like a, you know, a great aesthetic value for your home and convenient because you can go swimming right there. Um, and again, that's just, you know, that's our behavior. That's sort of like the American dream thing. All right, see, so I see something about a koi pond. Um, anyone want to speak to any of these other ones on the second page? They're awesome. They're great ideas here. Another one I personally hate is that we always design houses in a way that, you know, like I said, we have no big trees around them, but we have all these huge windows because we want a lot of light to be let in our house. So windows are great, and you can design windows in a way um, so that they're they're south-facing and they let light in in the colder months when you need it, but not the, the winter months. But often we put windows for aesthetic purposes, not for not thinking about heat gain. So we have all these huge windows that's letting a ton of light into our house that's heating up our house and making it so that we need air conditioning when we could potentially design in a way that we could get away without using air conditioning. All right, someone's got to want to talk about these seawalls or koi ponds or tree alleys. Anyone? Oh, yeah, that was me. Okay, so these three different things sort of, I was sort of thinking the same thing for all of them, which is that a lot of them are made from like seawalls and koi pines. A lot of the um, surrounding walls are made from cements, like how, um, I think that's how some pools are made too, um, I wasn't sure, but um, cement and concrete are really, really bad to produce and, um, you know, to perpetuate all that production but it's not even that great and there has to be some kind of you know equally strong and um, more hopefully environmentally friendly material that would also hopefully would cost less so that would be an incentive uh, and it black maybe yeah that was my thing about it anyway and then that I also I was also thinking about how um, I'm not completely sure how they did it, but I thought that like um, the Romans or the Greeks in ancient Greece, they would um, make things, make like baths or something out of clay or brick or something like we sort of spoke about in the presentation. So I was just mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, so just looking into those different types of building uh, materials. Right. Right. Great. Anyone else? How about the attics? Untreated attics, I assume you mean you have an attic where you're not heating or cooling. Um, it's sort of separate from the house. Um, and the alternatives here. Oh, so actually use the heating flow to naturally ventilate in your attic um, and transfer that transfer. Uh, that warmth or cool air in your attic into the house with integrated piping, so sort of like a heat exchanger style thing, I'm guessing. Any other ideas or ones people want to talk about, or at this time, just any general questions about those techniques we talked about in the course? While we're working on this, I'm going to jump back to the slides for a second and just talk you through the last couple of slides here. Um, so I put up um, sort of a sample uh, course listing of the program called Yes Tomorrow, Design, Build, School, and
in Vermont. Um, and they're a program that offers workshops in things like straw bale construction, tiny home design, building solar ovens, um, installing photovoltaics, um, all sorts of different sort of traditional building techniques. And this is just the one I happen to know about, but I know there are programs like this all across the country. Um, so if you're interested in learning more and actually not just hearing someone talk about straw buildings, but in actually doing a physical hand-on, this is how you build a straw bale building uh, sort of thing, there are courses out there. Um, and I'm just some uh, upcoming uh, engineer ESW short course. So we're going to be doing a short course on ancient engineering techniques. So talking about not only buildings, uh, but techniques used in agricultural production, water treatment and transport, uh, production of mechanical energy, and transportation and transportation infrastructure. So if this sort of interests you, um, just keep an eye out for that course. That should be happening later on in the summer. Um, for our course next week, uh, Rob Best is going to talk, be talking you through, I believe, through um, through tiny building design. Is that right, Rob? Do we set on our, um, do we pick our final topic? Rob says yes. So that will be the, the topic for uh, week five. So maybe some of these um, sort of low, um, low-tech building techniques will we'll come back in there as well. So with that, we're almost out of time, but I'm going to stay on for a few more minutes. So if people want to talk about um, some more of these ideas here, I'm happy to do that. And if not, thank you all for joining us, and we will see you uh, next week for the final uh, week of our course.